us what's the plan. <laughs> Not a problem. A kia ora tātou katoa, ko a tāia mai i raro i te tūnui o te whare nei i te ata nei, tēnā koutou katoa. Please finish this proverb for me. If it isn't broken, don't fix it, leave it, eh, eh, old school. I had a friend who was calling me and he said, Nahi, your degree is out of date. I said, what do you mean? I, you know, that uh, took me five years to get that first three-year degree. And uh, he said, your degree's out of date. Finish this statement. If it isn't broken, and I said exactly the same things. Don't fix it. Leave it. He said, eh, old school. He said, it is now. If it isn't broken, fix it. I said, what do you mean? There's nothing to fix. And he, he said, he pulled out a mobile phone and said, imagine if these people had said, this is a perfectly working phone, let's just leave it as it is. This device is now a video camera, a camera, a GPS device and a mini computer because someone said if it isn't broken, fix it. So when it comes to that, we had something that we needed to fix. We had someone who we wanted to be a presenter at this conference and extreme measures have been taken to get this next presenter to our conference. To introduce that presenter, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Ross Duncan, the CEO of Quality Healthcare Australia, who will introduce Dr. Brent James. Please give a round warm of applause for Dr. Ross Duncan. Good afternoon. Quality Healthcare Australia is really proud to be associated with this uh, presentation uh, of Brent James. It's, I believe it will be a unique experience and I hope you do too. I first met Brent James in 1993 at a medical informatics conference uh, in the US he was putting on a workshop on quality uh, around medical informatics and his co-presenter was Professor Reed Gardner who has an international reputation from the University of Utah. That workshop changed my life. Their work on improving clinical care was so extraordinary that I really couldn't believe it. They were telling me things that I thought were not true. Also, they had the data to support the work they were presenting. I've sought to understand how to systematically improve clinical care from that date. I'm still working on it. Brent James is a farm boy from Idaho with a passion for mathematics. He studied physics at the University of Utah and he became uh, highly proficient in what was then the developing art of computer science. He went on to study medicine at the University of Utah and became a surgeon with a huge interest in cancer and also research. He, along the way, picked up a master's degree in statistics. He worked for a time with the American College of Surgeons, developing, analyzing, and advising on large-scale research projects. He initiated many projects and from this work, he was uh, asked to go back to Utah in the mid-1980s, where he then joined Intermountain Healthcare, which is based in Salt Lake City which is a very large group of hospitals and clinics throughout Utah. His position there was Vice President of Research. His, he, with his clinician colleagues, started a number of extraordinary research projects into the clinical care going on in Intermountain Healthcare. And many of those are published, many of them you would know about. 
one of them that was initiated at that time was understanding how to give preoperative antibiotics to reduce postoperative infection. And that work was done in Inner Mountain Healthcare with Brent James. Brent was also at that time influenced by Edwards Deming, Ed Deming as often called. And he uh, uh, trained with Ed Deming for a while and Ed helped him to translate his work on quality improvement into work being done in Intermountain Healthcare. Brent also started teaching programs for medical staff, for doctors, many of them who were well-known researchers. And he taught them how to one, learn the principles of quality improvement, but also to apply them in a practical sense. In the early 90s, uh, Intermountain Healthcare established the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research with Brent as the executive director. This extraordinary organisation has now, since then, trained over 2,000 doctors, nurses and senior managers in the principles of quality improvement and how to apply them in a modern uh, environment. In addition, over 40 sister courses have developed around the world in six countries. Brent also has a number of academic affiliations with the Harvard School of Public Health and the University of Utah. He's published broadly on quality, cost, patient safety and electronic medical records. And he's contributed in a major way to influential publications of the Institute of Medicine, which you well know, to err as human, crossing the quality chasm, and one that's less known but important, patient safety. He's also been honoured uh, in many places, but uh, it's worthy to mention uh, his honour for the Ernest Codman Award, which is not given to many. He's also part of a very informal network of colleagues around the world trying to improve health care. Recently he was named in the 50 most influential physician executives in uh, a poll by the US magazine Modern Healthcare. He's also been advisor to the Obama administration. I don't know whether they took notice of his advice but certainly they asked for it. His colleagues when you read about their comments, certainly talk about Brent in extraordinary terms. There was an article in November 2009 at the height of the debate in the US about health reform, and it appeared in the New York Times Sunday magazine, and it was built around Brent James and his work at Intermountain Healthcare. And, Robert, and Dr. Robert Wachter, who's an influential US physician around patient safety, made these comments, and I quote, it, that is the article, profiles an iconoclastic and optimistic process, which just shows that this work is so hard, the payment incentives so perverse, and the cultural forces so daunting that you really need a Kevlar-wearing, bull-headed, saintly genius to get it done. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this saintly genius, Brent James. Thank you very much, Dr. Duncan. Uh, it's a true pleasure to be with you this, this afternoon and to share a little bit of our experience. The specific topic that I've been assigned has to do with uh, tackling the elephant in the room, paying physicians for good behavior. I should say just in terms of good ethics of presentation that I have no financial incentives associated with my work uh, aside from my employment here at Intermountain Healthcare. Just a little bit regarding the nature of Intermountain itself. Um, we're a charitable not-for-profit healthcare delivery system located in Utah, Idaho um, at a tertiary level, we serve seven surrounding states. It came into being in 1975 when the LDS Church decided to get out of the healthcare business. They took their then 15 hospitals and gave them as a gift to the community. Um, they formed a
community-based board of trustees, unpaid, to manage the resource, made up of business leaders, uh, patients, uh, health professionals, physicians, nurses, a few health policy experts. They really do control our, our work. Uh, we currently supply about 50 to 60 percent of all care delivery in this region of the United States. Uh, because of our size and because of our mission, frankly, in many ways I've discovered we function quite like many of your health systems. Uh, it would be fair to say that we're quasi-public. We supply most of the services to people in this region of the United States when they have no other access to services under the U.S. insurance market. We don't count insurance or ability to pay as a primary factor in determining the care that we give in any way. Um, in 1984, we started a HMO health plan. Currently, Intermountain Select Health provides funding for about 20% of the care we deliver. In 1992, we established an employed physician group. Uh, currently, Intermountain Medical Group employs about 850 physicians. If you examine the physician makeup of our region, we work with about 4,000 physicians in total, but among them, a smaller group of about 1,900 supplies perhaps 95% um, of all the care we deliver, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, among those 1,900, about 850 are employed. The remainder are community-based independent physicians. Um, finally, relative to our structure, we have about 160 outpatient clinics. Also, our hospital system has grown since. We currently have 23 facilities. They range from large urban quaternary teaching facilities, academic centers, uh, down through tertiary systems uh, with only maybe a family medicine residency, a general practice residency, serving regions, um, down to very, very small rural facilities where we're the only, only group delivering care, the sole source of care. The diameter of the Intermountain system is about 1,200 kilometers. Uh, we have a fairly extensive network of both aircraft, uh, helicopters, um, fixed-wing aircraft, and ambulances to serve that population. Well, with that, given the topic that I've been assigned, I thought it might be interesting to you to consider a, a real clinical example uh, Intermountain is a system we're responsible for about 60,000 type 2 diabetic patients within our network. Um, starting in about 1995, we put together an evidence-based best practice protocol. We call them care process models. Uh, they're fairly extensive. It's not sufficient to build the guideline. You have to deploy it into clinical workflows so that people don't have to remember um, if you rely upon memory, almost half the time it will not execute. But we deploy it into clinical workflows, I'll show you how. Uh, and we think that we've really changed diabetes care in this region of the United States. I tried to catch from our registry system, we have an extensive registry right when the change was happening. Unfortunately, that registry just gives me an eight year time window. It really starts in 1995, uh, for example, uh, poor blood sugar controls for diabetic in this country, hemoglobin A1C of greater than 9, that's associated with the major complications of diabetes mellitus, blindness, um, the kidney failure, uh, peripheral neuropathies, and, and amputation, chief source of amputation of the lower extremity in the United States, macrovascular cardiac disease and death. Uh, we started with about 25% of our patients having hemoglobin A1Cs of over 9. This picks up the knee of the curve as we implemented that care process model, that evidence-based best practice guideline, we watched the proportion of our patients with excessively high hemoglobin A1Cs, blood sugar controls poorly done, uh, fall to about 7%. I checked recently, it's running about 6%. The 25% when we started back in 1995 was typical for the United States. Um, the six percent is not. In fact, our outcomes of care compare very, very favorably with any good specialty group. Oh, oh with one big difference. Those 60,000 diabetics are managed by eight endocrinologists and a network of about 800 primary care physicians. I could show you similar statistics for a full range of measures, 
this is lipid control, that make up the totality of diabetes care um, for blood pressure control, uh, urinary proteins, retinal exams, fetal sensory exams. Um, we saw some real changes in care. Well, what I wanted to do is show you four tools that we used to blend this evidence-based best practice guideline into clinical workflows. And I'd just like to step through the four. Uh, this is the first. If you are a physician practicing here in Utah with Inner Mountain, the majority of whom are community-based independent physicians, every quarter, every three months, whether you like it or not, we will send you a packet of reports. This will be on top. It's called an action list. Um, I've stripped the patient names off this actual report, of course. What it does is for each patient, it runs the evidence-based best practice protocol against their current performance data relative to diabetes care. Lists it here to the right. Oh, any patient that is not at ideal care, you can, for example, see a flag right up here. It flags the patient, uh, showing that they have need for intervention. The truth is, is, is that you can generate this on demand. Most of our physicians, most of our primary care practices do it about monthly. I'm going to come back in a moment. Many of them now embed care management nurses in their practice, and that's the main person who follows up on this sort of a report in the practice, um, not just for diabetes, but for other major chronic conditions, heart failure, asthma, hypertension, chronic anticoagulation, depression, a whole series of conditions. But that's report number one, an action list. It's mechanism of action. It takes a chronic condition and makes it chronic. Rather than episodic in a traditional practice, you wait until the patient comes to visit and then you respond in a reactive way. This is more continuous. It gives you a way to reach out to patients to bring them in to manage their disease even when they're not in your office. Report number two is called a patient worksheet. I, we generally blend it into workflow uh, as part of the chart preparation process as we're getting ready for a clinic day in a primary care practice. Um, typically, the nurse preparing the charts will look the patient up on a computer. There's a button that says print patient worksheet, and this is what it generates. Uh, this is a, a made-up example. You'll see that up at the top, it lists basic patient demographics. Underneath, a list of problems and chronic conditions. Now, frankly, the real problems and chronic conditions we want to see listed are the chronic diseases that we're attempting to manage on a broad scale. A medication profile. Uh, this is obviously a made-up example. It only lists two medications. A real case would probably have 10 or 15. A preventive care summary. Labs pertinent to the chronic conditions. Exams pertinent to the chronic conditions. And then down here at the bottom, we call them passive reminders. Um, we run the evidence-based best practice protocol against the patient's record, looking for any area where the patient is not up to speed on testing rates or level controls. Um, the guideline contains recommendations for next steps. Passive reminders are really a form of order entry. They're very carefully worded to avoid legal perjuration, but it just says what needs to happen now. Should this patient advance in their blood sugar control regimen? Um, are they late for a particular test? Uh, do they need a particular preventive exam or an immunization even, let's say? Most of our physicians do use them as order lists. Um, many of them use it electronically in electronic medical record. Others print it out in a paper system, but they just mark them and pass them along. So that's tool number two that help produce that massive change, um, patient worksheets. Tool number three, in some ways, is one of the most interesting. Uh, it's a comparative outcomes report. This one reports the data of Dr. Stephen Towner. I use it with his permission. He's a general internist, trained at Mayo Clinic, but he runs an internal medicine practice, just general internal medicine, general practice, out of the Salt Lake Clinic. He has a very large diabetes practice for general medicine, 244 diabetics in his practice, type 2 diabetics listed right here. This column of numbers shows that each of the measurement rates, if they're up to speed or not, for example, uh, on this particular report, 100% of Dr. Towner's patients had a recently recorded 
blood pressure, 98% had a recently recorded hemoglobin A1C within the criteria of the guideline, you see. Now, Steve is the blue bars, his region is the green, our system as a whole is the red. Um, these bars to the right show level controls. So this particular section, for example, is hemoglobin A1Cs. The safe range, uh, A1C in the U.S. under 7 is considered safe. Um, about 70% of Dr. Towner's patients fall into that range. Only 2% of his patients have A1Cs of greater than 9, where they're at high risk for some sort of a complication. Similar data for blood pressure, for lipids, eye tests, um, urinary proteins, so on down through the full list of performance factors around diabetes mellitus. Uh, we have a version of this that then goes to the medical director. We have medical directors assigned in each region, whether you're employed or not. Um, I jokingly tell my colleagues if they do poorly on their outcomes reports, uh, it's worth a free lunch. Their medical director is going to invite them to lunch, you see. This is the version of the report that goes to that medical director as month by month they track performance across an entire region with direct line accountability for those physicians for performance across the system. Oh, oh there is a fourth tool that's pertinent to our topic of discussion today. We added a financial incentive. It's about 3,000 U.S. dollars. It's based not just on diabetes, but on a series of measures of quality, a handful really selected by the program each year. But you could increase your take-home pay by about $3,000 or decrease it. That's at the maximum. Probably for most of our physicians, it's more on the range of $1,000 or $1,500, plus or minus is what the actual swing is in terms of their take-home pay. Now, we deployed these tools in such a way across the many practices that we help support that we could measure the marginal impact across those tools. And it was these tools, this is a way of blending a, a guideline into a workflow that produced the results that you were seeing. A massive shift in the quality of care delivery for our diabetic patients. A little bit more on those outcomes in just a moment. But a question for you. Of the four measurement tools that I just showed you, which was the most effective in driving change? So take a minute and think of the four tools, the action lists, the patient worksheets, the comparative outcomes, the financial incentives. In your judgment, in your experience, which was most effective in driving the change you just witnessed? Now, I have a very good view of, of you as an audience. I'd like you to, to just show of hands, raise your hand high. You get to vote for exactly one. How many of you think that the main driver was the action list? I've got about three or four hands. Okay. How many of you think it was the patient worksheets? Hmm, I don't see any. How many of you think it was the comparative outcomes reports? Yeah, the vast majority. How many of you think it was the financial incentives? Oh, yeah. That's number two, I guess, in our voting. Um, here's what you need to know. I listed them in order of their impact. The largest impact were the action lists. The second largest, neck and neck, actually, it's almost impossible to tell which was most impactful, was the patient worksheets. By the time you come down to the comparative outcomes, the effect is quite small. Uh, under 10%. Um, so far as I can tell, the financial incentives had no impact whatsoever. In fact, we primarily added it just because it seemed to be fair to our clinicians who were driving massive changes, not just in the quality of care, but the cost of care, reduced hospitalization rates particularly, seemed fair that they should participate in some of those benefits. A question to ask yourself as you think about this, uh, Dr. Deming used to always say, aim defines the system. He said it routinely, and it was a great piece of advice, but I want to add a line of my own. If aim defines the system, change creates the system. What is your change strategy? 
as you think of deploying programs like this, you have to have a pretty strong empiric model for change. So my question for you would be, what is your change strategy? Let me describe two that we could use with the comparative outcomes. It's interesting. The argument most people use relative to why that comparative outcomes report would work is, is because physicians are very competitive. There's an implication, though. The implication is, is that those physicians know what to do and are just choosing not to do it. Or alternatively, that with a little bit of work, they could figure out what to do but are failing at that level. They just don't apply themselves to figure out what to do either. Yeah, if that were true, then showing comparative outcomes would shame them or through their competitive juices cause them to substantially work harder perhaps to improve their care delivery. Is that how you see physicians? Is that how you experience them? That in some sense are malingerers? That without constant urging they won't work hard? Uh, that they're happy to live with um, really substandard performance unless somebody calls them on it, you see? Now, over the years, I've developed a different way of thinking about my physician colleagues, well, specifically, but it's more general. Nurses as well, our pharmacists too, our therapists, physical respiratory therapists, that whole long subgroup of health professionals, even our administrators. Here's the way that I think of it anymore. Just assume that those frontline clinicians are as smart as I am, they are, are as dedicated to patients as I am. It turns out they are deeply, deeply dedicated to these, these people who come to seek their help. They know them personally. They're real human beings to them. They're very hardworking. They're at least as hardworking as I am. It's not a matter of motivating them. They're as motivated as I am. More fundamentally, they're the only people with what we call fundamental knowledge, with the hands-on knowledge of how it actually works at the front line, down there at the coal face where the change has to occur. The trick is, is they don't control the systems within which they work. They don't control the context of their daily work to any great degree. My question to you would be, relative to change strategy, how would you, your proposed intervention make it easier for them to do it right? You see? I have over a hundred successes in Intermountain, similar to the one that I've just shown you. I can point to literally thousands of lives, people who didn't die who would have. And as we improve quality of care, um, we change those mortality rates, we change suffering rates. It was accompanied by massive savings in healthcare costs. We estimate that at a variable cost level, we've taken at least $150 million per year out of Intermountain in structural cost by using these techniques. In every instance, the question was, how do you make it easy to do it right? You see, they don't control that context. I do, as a leader of our system. Um, and that's turned out to be probably the best, most functional change idea that we've ever had. Could I just finish up on diabetes a bit um, before I go there? It turns out there's a wonderful book on this topic that just recently came out. It's by Daniel Pink. It's called Drive. He carefully reviews the business literature around things that incentivize people, what motivates us, what causes us to act. He describes almost perfectly that sense of motivation or effect of change um, what causes people to act as an agent for change. He describes it almost perfectly in terms of what quality improvement theory describes. Um, the difference is, of course, that he doesn't do it in that context at all, but I recommend it to you highly. Relative to understanding incentives and how you make programs work in an effective way. Um, just to come back to diabetes, we, a few years ago, well, technically nine years ago, had an issue arise. We had these tools out in place. We were seeing real change. We thought that it would work better if we deployed care management nurses into primary care practices. Now, of course, this would just be the ones where we had employed physicians, where we really run and own the practices. Um, we proposed that to some of our clinical leadership. They reacted fairly negatively. They pointed out that we did not receive reimbursement for those nurses. It would simply be another salary on our, our general budget with no source of income 
to counterbalance it. We counter-argued back that we thought that we'd see real improvements in patient outcomes and general productivity. In the end, we decided to run a trial. Um, we had a sub-issue in this trial. The question was, did these care process models, these evidence-based best practice protocols, work only for simple disease, isolated diabetes, for example? How did they behave for complex disease? So the makeup of the trial, the treatment arm, uh, complex diabetics, a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus type 2 with at least three significant comorbid diseases. Uh, in the context of that care management nurse embedded in a primary care practice um, with the decision support tools that I just showed, our workflow deployment of our evidence-based best practice guideline, uh, a good network of backup referral physicians um, to use when necessary, uh, and then finally, very strong communications. Uh, that same electronic medical record really facilitates the communications necessary across a far-flung team, frankly. Uh, we ran the trial, complex diabetics without those resources in one arm, with the resources in the other. What we discovered was, first, a significant decline in mortality rates at two years, about a 3% decline in mortality. Um, the yellow line is the treatment group, the white line, the control group. We discovered that at two years, our hospitalization rate for these complex advanced diabetics fell from 39% to 31%. Uh, this is some tens of millions of dollars per year for us. I, I've never put an exact number on it, but it's significant. Um, and finally, we found that physician productivity in our clinics increased by about 8%. Now, it took about four or five primary care physicians in the same practice location to keep one generalist care management nurse busy. But that 8% improvement in productivity for the physicians, more patient seeing capacity, actually paid for the nurse all by itself. Today, they call this an accountable medical home. The truth is, is we've been running them this way for the, the last nine or 10 years. We've tried to deploy that to all of our internal practices. It's been associated with significant improvements in outcomes across all of the major chronic diseases that we manage in those practices. We also have a stable of generalist care management nurses that reside in our health plan and then support the private practices where we don't have a direct um, budgetary role uh, and those small practices that are only one or two physicians where we can't justify the personnel to actually embed a nurse. I should tell you that the embedded nurses work better than the ones who work out of the central nurse bank for this purpose. Um, can I show you one more clinical example just to illustrate another aspect of this same thing? I'm going to suggest to you that the financial incentives may work best at an organizational level rather than at an individual physician level. This particular example has to do with the largest single process that Intermountain manages as a system. We deliver about 34,000 babies per year in our hospitals. More than half of all children born in this region of the United States, um, at least in the practice commonly used in the United States, very often the physicians involved, the obstetricians, the family medicine doctors, uh, like to offer the mothers to be something called elective induction. So now this is separate from medically indicated, chemically induced labor. Um, that's a much smaller subset and frankly is to deal with some sort of complication for the child or for the mom. Um, this is where it's done because the end stages of pregnancy are very uncomfortable and because the physicians typically prefer to deliver this patient whom they know have a long-standing relationship themselves and would prefer that they not enter labor while their partner is on call. Uh, Full-term delivery is 40 weeks gestational age right here. Um, there's a well-established scientific association uh, between gestational age in elective inductions where it's a simple matter of choice uh, and admission to the newborn ICU. These bars show admission rates to the newborn ICU as you come back to 38 weeks, 37 weeks, there are statistically significant increases in NICU admission rates. It represents a, a pretty good measure of harm to the child associated with early elective induction. 
It was a fascinating thing. Uh, we have an organizational structure within Intermountain to deal with this. It's called our OB development team. It's a group of obstetricians, nurse midwives, um, family medicine physicians who deliver babies. Well, really representatives across the full geographic spread of our system. We get together every month for three or four hours and track this process and our performance on it. I remember the day that the leader of that program, a perinatologist named Dr. Brian Oshiro, showed this graph to that group of assembled uh, child care delivery specialists. Um, we showed him the graph and Brian said, perhaps we should focus in on this as an opportunity. We got a fairly typical physician response. Well, the original graph he showed them was taken from New England Journal of Medicine. It was a published report. Um, people looked at it, considered it very seriously. After a moment of quiet, one of the obstetricians raised his hand and said, Brian, um, I can't recall in my practice a single instance where a child has been sent to the newborn ICU because of an early elective induction. And the other people around the table nodded their heads, agreed they couldn't recall having seen such a thing. It's not a problem for us. This might be a problem on the East Coast where this paper was generated, but certainly not for us. Well, the fortunate thing, uh, we maintain a full registry. We have data that's current within a couple of days at any given point in time for any of these care delivery processes. Uh, it took about 20 minutes for my statistician assigned to the OB development team, Eric Henry, to run our own data. In fact, this slide is our own data. There was a dead giveaway. It's those huge sample sizes up at the top. You're looking at about 60 to 80,000 patients here across a period of a few years. It was uh, not surprising, but deeply gratifying. When they saw their own data, these physicians had a completely different response. Just by seeing the data, it's credible data, suddenly instead of saying, I don't believe we have a problem, it became perhaps we have an opportunity. They therefore built a very simple care process model into our workflows. Um, in the past, the woman would talk to her, to her physician, to her nurse midwife, and say, you know, I'd really like to get this baby delivered. Um, it's very uncomfortable. The physician would say, well, perhaps next Tuesday is a good day for me when I'm on call. Um, if you haven't gone into spontaneous labor, just go to the hospital, go to the labor and delivery suite. Uh, tell them I sent you. They know how to deal with this. Um, they will check you into the facility. They will get you in a bed. They'll start an IV and start a drug called oxytocin which will cause your body to go into labor and we'll get this baby delivered. That was the old workflow. The new workflow was identical except when the woman appeared at the hospital and said my, my physician sent me, the first thing the nurses did was to run the ACOG criteria. We build them into our electronic medical record. There's actually nine factors on that list. The big one, the one that really counts had the big impact was gestational age. If a patient was less than 39 weeks gestational age, that matches the ACOG criteria. It was a phone call back to their physician saying, Doctor, your patient does not meet professional criteria for appropriate elective induction. Before we could proceed, we need a consult from either a high-risk pregnancy specialist, a perinatologist, uh, or from the department chair. In fact, in some of our hospitals, if the physician attempts to override and says, do it anyway, the nurses would respond, um, I'm not allowed in our hospital to deliver care that does not meet professional guidelines. Doctor, if you want this to happen, you will need to come into the hospital and start the IV and start the oxytocin yourself. Leave your clinic and come on in. Well, this turns out to have an impact. Um, this slide shows the rate of inappropriate elective induction inside Intermountain as they did that. It went from 28% of all elective inductions, a common practice here in the United States. It fell initially to about 6%. Later, they tightened their criteria. Well, today it runs at about 3%. Now, a background principle that I haven't had time to develop, I can prove scientifically that I cannot write protocols that perfectly fit any patient. And the patients who come to us are just too variable. We therefore actively encourage our nursing staff, our medical staff, to vary based upon individual patient needs with appropriate safeguards in place. Um, 
Frankly, I've looked at that 3% of patients who fall outside, um, for lack of a better term, they're just clinically weird. I mean, you get these strange happenings going on. Um, I really don't think you can write a pro protocol that perfectly fits, and of course you have to adjust. It turns out that non-compliance rate, the appropriate non-compliance rate, is a feature of the protocol. Uh, ventilator management of acute respiratory distress syndrome in a, in a major ICU uh, typically gets about 96% compliance. Choice of antibiotics for a community-acquired pneumonia patient, uh, last I looked, it was running about 88 to 90% compliance. Um, so you see the idea behind this. Now, our OB development team was quite pleased with this response. Uh, the main transition happened across about four months to see that swing. Remember that most of these physicians were community-based independent physicians. Very few of them at the time were employed by Intermountain, uh, what you would call VMOs in some sense, I believe, um, but a major response. No financial incentives at all, uh, none whatsoever, uh, then or later, frankly. Well, the team liked that so well that they added to it. Um, the following year, they added something called a Bishop score to their criteria. It's a four-part physical measure that determines whether the woman's body is ready to deliver. There are physical changes that happens to a woman's body as they come close to delivery. Um, the usual criterion within the profession is a Bishop score of 10 or higher uh, in order to induce labor. The yellow bars show first deliveries, primaparous deliveries. Uh, the blue bars are multiparous, second, third, fourth, they're easier and faster. This shows unplanned cesarean section rates, um, surgical deliveries. At a Bishop score of 10 for primaparous deliveries, 5.8%. Come back just a couple of points, it triples. Uh, in the before setting, it was not uncommon to see primaparous multiparous women delivered with Bishop scores of 1, 2, and 3. Um, when they were induced for labor on a purely elective basis. It's not just unplanned C-section, it's also length of labor. At a Bishop's score of 10 for that first labor, the hard one, a relatively fast, easy labor of about nine hours. It's very easy to increase that by 50% just by ignoring a Bishop's score coming back. Well. They added bishop score to the criteria, so ACOG criteria plus bishop score. It had an impact. This slide shows it. Uh, this is just measuring the change. The most important line is that blue line. It shows among all first deliveries the proportion that were inappropriately electively induced. You need to know that today at many of our hospitals, community medical staffs, uh, the medical staff has outlawed primary selective induction. The only reason to use those drugs to start labor is a medical indication. Um, that was at their own behest. Again, no financial incentives whatsoever. On the other hand, this had major financial impact. Uh, the length of time that women spent in labor within our system declined. This is overall, uh, we took about 45,000 minutes out of length of labor. What does that mean? It means that we could deliver about 1,500 more children per year without a single additional labor and delivery suite or a single additional nurse. Uh, from a financial perspective, that's called fixed cost leverage. It means that we can delay for five years, sometimes 10 years, expanding our facilities uh, in the face of the growing communities that we see here in Utah. It had a direct impact on unplanned C-section rates. The reason that Intermountain runs rate this last year of 21%, while the rest of the United States is at 34%, is exactly that elective induction protocol. It has major financial consequences. Each year that team addressed a new area. The one that you just saw was 2003. But they have a cumulative impact. This is variable cost savings for the mother and for the child, not the fixed cost, just the variable cost of operations. They're cumulative. They're structural. Uh, by 2004, we'd taken more than $10 million in variable cost savings just out of this one work process. I need to show you one more thing, though. Um, has to do with how health care is paid here in the United States, and to some degree where you are, if I understand it correctly. Um, we live or die as a health system 
on what are called operating margins. It's the difference between the monies we receive to care for patients. They're effectively budgets. It's usually a premium amount and the monies that we expend. Uh, if we come up short, nobody bails us out. Uh, we simply fail. Uh, well, that means that we pay fairly close attention to that net operating income, the difference between our actual costs of care um, and the amount of money allocated to that care. Let me show you what that looks like for unplanned C-section. A normal delivery, if its actual cost is a one, it has a net operating income of $303. Uh, this is for growth, this is for equipment replacement, this is for the general operations of a hospital to keep it running over time. We usually target right around 3%, give or take, across many conditions the minimum amount to stay alive. On the other hand, if we do an unplanned C-section, the actual cost of care is 2.05 times higher. The trouble is, is that the reimbursement is higher too. We're paid on a DRG basis, a per case basis, by case type, $648. Just to illustrate the impact, uh, Ware Branch, the physician who heads up our women's newborn clinical program, the OB development team now, thinks that we might be able to reduce our unplanned C-section rate by an additional two percentage points from 6.25 to 4.25 percent. That would be about 670 fewer C-section deliveries per year. It would reduce our cost of operations by about two million dollars. Unfortunately, it would reduce our payments under that DRG system by about 2.2 million. And Intermountain would actually lose about $225,000 in the operating margins that are essential to our financial survival to be able to move ahead in time. Can I show you a second example? Um, this one happened at a small community hospital about 40 miles south of me, American Fork Hospital, beautiful little community, young, growing rapidly, very large birthing service. Um, they have about 110 children per year that develop a condition called respiratory distress syndrome. Now, 110 children who are not small premature infants, they have gestational age of at least 33 weeks, between 33 and 37 weeks typically. The last organ system in the child's body to mature is the lungs. Um, and it means they have immature lungs. They tend to collapse. The little air sacs, the alveoli at the end of the bronchial tree, they collapse. Uh, it's not just that they can't oxygenate, of course, with those alveoli collapse, no gas movement into the blood, no oxygen in, no carbon dioxide out. Uh, so deadly at that level. It's also the fact that the tissue being in contact actively damages the tissue. Um, it damages the tissue and then you have to recover, you see. That's respiratory distress syndrome. And again, they had about 110 children per year who suffered this who were greater than 33 weeks gestational age. Now, traditionally, the way that we, we manage that is we ship them about 15 miles down the road to a big tertiary center that Intermountain Healthcare runs. It's a support hospital for American Fork and a number of others down in those mostly rural communities. Um, what we would do is transport them to the newborn ICU, intubate the infant, use a, a ventilator positive pressures through a ventilator to try to reinflate their lung and typically would hold them in the hospital for a week perhaps. They, they tend to do very well. They didn't die very often. Uh, on the other hand, it was quite expensive care. You had to give their lungs a chance to recover. The physicians, the obstetricians particularly, Dr. Terry Melendez at American Fork and the other obstetricians began to work with the neonatologists at Utah Valley um, and they had an idea. Uh, we have a well-proven technology that's been used for decades, really, in neonates. It's called nasal continuous positive airway pressure. It's the same technology we use for adult patients suffering from sleep apnea. It plugs into your nose and blows positive pressure up into your nose as people sleep. Same thing. They said, you know, um, this lung disease is relatively mild. I wonder if the positive pressure in their airways generated by nasal continuous positive airway pressure and CPAP, nasal CPAP, I wonder if it'd be sufficient. So they ran a little trial of um, NCPAP, uh, some oxygen, a uh, drug called surfactant that reduces surface tension in the lung. It's a form of soap that's, uh, uh, how to say it, biosafe.
to the infant's lungs that makes it easier to reinflate. When they did that, the transport rate of this class of infants from American Fork to the, the newborn ICU fell from 78% to 18%. Now, anyone would agree that that's a much better clinical outcome, unquestionably. It was also a much cheaper clinical outcome, as I'm about to show you. I bet it had an impact on our ability to operate as a care delivery system. Let me just show you the data. These are the actual numbers. Now, you have to understand, I have two advantages over you. Uh, only two, probably. Uh, the first is, we don't have artificial barriers between our primary care and our secondary care. And we tend to maintain much better coordinated communication between those groups. They tend to function as part of the same groups. And in watching care in Australia and New Zealand in the past, I think you struggle with that compared to us. I have a second potential advantage against the many that you have. Um, I can measure cost accurately. Because of the structure of the payment system here in the United States, we had strong incentives to put in place very accurate cost measurement, and we did. I can measure true cost at a granular level that's accurate to within a couple of percentage points. And then comes back up against departmental level, facility level budgets in an accurate way. Well, I just ran it. Remember the idea that what we're really held accountable for is net operating income? We have to have about 3% to survive. If we drop below that, we will fail as a facility over time. Federal law will allow us up to eight. We specifically target about three as a system to keep our cost burden on the community low over time. Well, here's what happened. At American Fork Hospital, this little community hospital, their operating margin on this group of 110 children increased from $84,000 to $550,000. That's because those kids were staying at American Fork for typically up to a week, maybe even 10 days. They call it a newborn ICU, a level one NICU. It looks like a nursery to me. But you see these children in there on nasal CPAP with some oxygen, typically. Uh, so there's more intense care delivered in that setting, and um, it raises the operating margin. Now, we pay for the nurses who attend the transport when the children have to move, and they have a call schedule with an on-call fee. In the past, when they were on call, we used them. So there was some reimbursement associated with that. Uh, under the new system, they were on call, received an on-call fee, and we didn't use them. <laughs> So we lost about $50,000 in operating margin from that shift. The real impact, though, came up at the newborn ICU. Uh, in the before state, um, in the control arm, they had about $960,000 in operating margin from treating this large group of children in their NICU on an annual basis. Fell to about 210000 We lost about $750,000 in operating margin. Net impact on the hospitals, Intermountain as a system, as a care delivery system, lost about $330,000 in operating margin by improving care and significantly reducing the cost of care. We went back to track the impact on insurers. Now, the short version, the state of Utah saved about $280,000 per year in reduced billings that they didn't have to pay through their Medicaid program. Uh, health insurance plans saved about another $600,000. Through no work of their own, health care payers in our region from this one hospital, one project, saved about $870,000. While we as a system took a $330,000 margin hit. So my question for you is, what's wrong with that picture? You see? Our response as a charitable not-for-profit is, is that we immediately deployed it across all of Intermountain and turned a, a mere $330,000 loss into almost a $10 million margin loss for our system. Here's the problem. It takes money to run these projects. It takes effort. It takes resources. Even when we're philosophically committed, ethically committed, professionally committed, your ability to pursue these sorts of activities for other classes of patients declines remarkably. The impact of this, you'd go into our newborn ICUs that were bustling and suddenly they were one-third empty. It took us a few years to right-size the resource to the legitimate community needs. Some of those communities were growing and we just let it grow up under others. We shifted the resource to other uses. 
you see. I'll have to say the payment system was an active barrier to drive that better care and at the same time cheaper care. Uh, a very significant anchor against positive movement. Well, we've learned a few things in the United States about this. Let me just say it this way. Current payment mechanism, the GRG payment system, discounted fee for service payment system, actively incentive reutilization. You're paid more to do more. I have seen that in your countries too, especially around procedure rates. Oh, it's uh, fascinating at the same time, very discouraging. I'm paid to harm my patients. When patients have preventable complications in my hospital, I actually increase reimbursements. Um, the big one is actively disincents innovation that reduces costs through better quality. Um, there's very strong deep white evidence showing exactly this effect throughout U.S. healthcare at least. Well, this slide shows an interesting phenomenon. We know that we have to bend the cost curve on healthcare. Uh, we've only done one thing in the history of the United States that caused that to occur. It was 1993 through 2000. It's the HMO movement. Uh, it reduced the total cost of healthcare in the United States 14% below projections. The chief mechanism of action was what we generically call capitated payment, where care providers, physician-led groups, were given a fixed premium to provide all necessary care to patients within their purview. What's happening in the United States is frankly a, a strong return to that model. The reason that it first failed was because of perceptions that it misaligned financial incentives, that physicians would have incentives to withhold necessary care in order to benefit financially. We had a series of major studies that examined whether the HMO movement, by applying those financial incentives, had damaged care. In fact, they showed that quality had improved slightly. The philosophic argument about inappropriate financial incentives to withhold care did not get empiric support. We think that we're moving back there. The names that you hear coming out of the United States, accountable care organizations, accountable medical homes, yesterday a release of a bundled payment system, shared savings systems, they're all sophisticated forms of capitation when you examine their financial mechanisms closely. I'm going to argue that there'll be two major differences in this pass, and I think they apply to you too. Uh, the first, we have far better data systems than we had 20 years ago. They're better in two ways. The first, we can risk adjust better so that we get better payment aligned to better patient need. Um, so that for the more seriously ill, they come with more payment um, that reflects their true need as a care delivery group manages their care. That's uh, the second one. In this instance, rather than asking bureaucrats at a distance, insurance company executives, for example, or insurance company workers, uh, government offices, to manage the care, we're asking care delivery teams at the bedside to manage the care. We think that that set of incentives that I talked about in my first case study, um, diabetes mellitus, will come into play. We've seen it within our system. This represents managed care at the bedside. Better risk adjustment, oh, even more important. We have good enough quality metrics that we'll be able to demonstrate that our quality is improving, not declining. So we'll have the basis for saying that better care is cheaper care on a broad scale. Um, we'll have the basis for saying that managed care makes sense when it's a care delivery team at the bedside managing that care as opposed to someone at a distant remove through insurance or through government regulators. We think that there is over 50% waste in the U.S. healthcare system. A careful analysis has shown that your rates won't be quite as high, but they'll still be quite substantial huge opportunities to save money by improving care, not by withholding care. Uh, we think that the answer is, is good data. Well, let me just summarize it this way. The healing professions are changing. A few years ago, the boards that oversee medicine started to shift in this direction. Why? Documentation of far better clinical results at far lower costs. Uh, number two, it requires similar massive changes in care delivery operations. Um, it's very tightly linked to better internal data for risk adjustment and for quality verification. It's often called organized care. 
Healthcare is an organized system focused around patient need, in sharp contrast to healthcare organized around facilities, organized around technology, organized around physicians, particularly. When you start to do quality improvement process management, that's where it pushes you, that's where it forces you. Um, yeah. Uh, financial incentives aligned to appropriate patient-centered professional goals. So here's the idea. It turns out that physicians and nurses are primarily driven, read Pink's book, primarily driven by their professional values, professional goals. Your aim is to align the financial incentives to those professional values so they line up. If you attempt to use them independently of the professional values, you'll deliver a truly noxious message that will do serious damage. The trouble is that some of your physicians will believe you that money is number one. It's never number one in the healing professions. It's always number two. Their first goal, they're deeply socialized in this in their training, is the best care of their patients. Well, think about it. They know these people as individuals. Imagine a circumstance in which they were willing to harm one of their patients in order to make money. That's what you're implying. We have a word for that. It's called sociopathy. Most physicians and nurses are not sociopaths. Uh, say what you might, the healing professions are extremely good in screening out that behavior and training in exactly the opposite way in the initial training and then in the follow-up as people continue in their practice. It's just not an adequate model to think about the clinician-patient relationship. Empiric evidence supports that view. Oh, one last idea. Don't wait for government. In the United States today, most of the change is coming in the commercial market. I have an old friend, a fellow named Don Berwick. We've been working together for 30 years. He chose to try to work this from the government side. Bless his heart. Somebody needs to be there to make it work right. What I'm forced to tell Don, though, is, is that we're already a year to two years ahead of them in terms of our relationships with our private markets here in Utah. Uh, for us, it's largely going to be worked out before the Medicare program in the United States, the government-led health care program, really starts to get a team on the field in any significant way. Um, we were talking about the elephant in the room, financial incentives for physicians. Um, my strong advice to you is to use professional incentives. Money is important, but money's always number two. Keep it in its proper place. Um, and with that, let me say thanks for your time and attention. Do we have time for comments or questions, Dr. Duncan? Brent, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that we probably have time for two questions, uh, but no more. Could I have, uh, is there a question in the house? We have some ladies in green who have a microphone. I can't believe this audience is so stunned that uh, they can't ask some questions. Anyone wants to make a comment? Am I missing someone? Yes, we have someone on the far left. You mentioned about professional um, incentives, and what about for general practice practitioners who are running independent businesses? Because a lot of them are independently minded, and a lot of them, based on capitation, is purely looking at a business model rather than the, not necessarily the clinical outcome for the patient. You know what we did within Intermountain around that particular problem is is that we uh, made their care transparent. We invested fairly heavily in good data systems so that the physicians, the nurses involved could see exactly what kind of results their patients were receiving. Not just short-term outcomes, but in some circumstances, quite long-term outcomes. Uh, we found that it completely overrode all financial incentives. Now, they don't control those systems. That's part of our job. We knew that they needed to survive financially to be good partners. That's where the financial benefits appeared. I said it earlier, our purpose was to, in a fair way, share the benefits of their work back with them. We sometimes call them shared savings models. We want them to be successful. We want them to, to have an ongoing practice. Uh, we need them. 
Uh, it's easiest, of course, with our employed physicians, quite straightforward. Um, but we'll never have a complete system in Utah, I think, just with the employed physicians. We need our, our community-based partners as well. But that's how we think of it. Patients first. <laughs> and then work the money out underneath. Uh, that's been a very strong strategy for us, I'll have to tell you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, uh, on the right of the room and on the left. Well, thank you. Hi, um, Rachel Taylor, New Zealand. Really interested when you were talking, it's all a focus on the clinicians. What about your non-compliant patients and the impact they may have on your clinicians' reports? Um, we, well, how to say it? There are a couple of mechanisms that work. Uh, in the center of each of our evidence-based best practice guidelines is something we call a treatment cascade. So let's just take in diabetes, the subset around hemoglobin A1Cs. Our first te step in treating that, the first step in the cascade is very thorough patient education adapted to their culture and circumstance. Uh, we have certified diabetic educators who do that. We invest in it fairly heavily. We regard the patient as the first source of care for that chronic disease. In terms of management of their blood sugars, it starts with metformin fairly inexpensive oral hypoglycemic. Uh, if we get level controls with metformin, we hold them. Otherwise, we drop to next step in the cascade. I think it's a cephalonuria, it's a specific one. Uh, same basic philosophy, we attempt level controls of their blood sugars with the cephalonuria. If we're successful, we hold them on that therapy. If we're not, we drop to combined therapy of a cephalonuria plus metformin. Same philosophy, if we get level controls, we're good. Otherwise, this is all part of the evidence-based best practice guideline. We drop yet another level, simple insulins, complex insulins. The last step in the process is referral to a specialist. So we regard our specialty care as the last step in the cascade. It means that we failed to manage their condition in a primary care setting despite a full good effort, uh, holding back nothing. Because of this, we tend to concentrate our really hard, bad patients of the sort that you're describing in the specialist practice. And we use that setting to align resources to them to try to help. Um, it's a strange thing. Uh, our specialists have worse clinical outcomes than our typical primary care practices, but that's the way the system's designed. Our argument is, is when you went into the specialty of diabetology that that's what you volunteered to do. Now, most of those people are employed, so we have a, a structure by which we can better support them at that level. So we think of it as a system, you see. And we try to make our primary care practices successful by, how to say it, honoring, respecting, understanding, measuring the realities of real frontline practice. And one of those realities is sometimes non-compliant patients. Well, how do you deal with it? How do we measure it? How do we support them? Uh, that's how we think about it in a partnership rather than some sort of a controlled relationship, if you will. I have to uh, uh, leave it at that and uh, say goodbye, but I would like the audience to join me in showing their appreciation of your presentation. Uh, I hope that... the rest of the conference is truly wonderful. Thanks, Brent. And thanks for your indulgence, and at least listen to me hold forth. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, would you kindly, uh, we're a little bit behind time, if you could uh, now.